Welcome to Music Industry City's Tuesday Talk is where we discuss what's going on in the world of music business. I'm Peter Schwing and joining me today are my co-hosts, Sam Tall and The Duke. If there's something you'd like to chime in about, join us in the live chat or let us hear your thoughts in the comments below. So today, the team is going to talk about Twitch streamers once again are getting DMC ta DMCA takedown notices and Neva's SOS Festival raises nearly $2 million for independent music venues. So we have a lot to cover. Let's get to it. GameSpot reported, along with many other outlets, that Twitch streamers are getting DMCA takedown notices again. Twitch has been extremely vague in the past about their policy and have previously muted music from the video on demand service, but now they have fired a big warning shot to their streamers via email who use copyrighted music and they also, the official Twitch support Twitter account posted responses to these outraged users. In it, I have to click this button over here. In it, the content was identified and deleted for you in accordance with its obligations under the DMCA. Going forward, clips that are identified as having copyrighted music will be deleted without penalty to ensure you do not receive DMCA notifications from right holders. Twitch's copyright strike system is still unclear and they need to clarify what defines repeat offenders and when they may terminate an account. Twitch says the service would not apply to live streams though. Many streamers are furious because there is no way for users to file counterclaims like on Facebook and YouTube, which have been notorious for placing false copyright claims. Some streamers are also claiming a conspiracy due to the timing of Twitch's rollout of Soundtrack just days before the takedown emails were sent. Soundtrack is Twitch's licensed music platform. This is certainly not something that is going to go away anytime soon. And here with us and his thoughts on this is Sam Tall. Sam, how are you? Hey, Peter. How's it going? I'm good, man. It's just I, I wish that it was easier for creators to be as good as well. So, man, it, it, this is this is now Twitch's day of reckoning to deal with the music <laughs> industry, DMCA and their outraged user base. So, yeah. you know, what, what's your thoughts on this? So my thoughts on this are we've come too far for too long to keep doing the same thing. This is the kind of game that we've been playing for what, like nine years now since the Viacom YouTube debacle that gave us content ID. Um, I mean, this is even true around the time of Facebook launching its rights manager uh, suite of tools for, frankly, major labels. There are lots of independent uh, rights administrators who just never got access to rights manager. Um, and even as a user, I would get like not even like a business user or a creator or verified or anything. But on Instagram, I would get takedowns whenever I posted a clip, you know, of music in my story. And the uh, the, the claiming track was a a a a a a a by unknown artist. Easy to dispute, but there's no reason for me to even have to go through that and, and decide like, oh, maybe I'm getting looked at unfairly or whatever. Like it just it doesn't jive well. For rights owners, it doesn't jive well for creators. It just doesn't seem like anybody wins except for the platform trying to cover their ass and get out of, you know, potential legal trouble. Um, you know, there's a right way to do it. There's a wrong way to do it. It used to be that the nature of the beast was you had to fight tooth and nail with uh, rights owners to kind of be forced to change paradigm. But nowadays we have, you know, a track record. We have precedent. We know how to do this kind of stuff. We know equitable models that allow companies to still grow while compensating creators. I mean, this brings back what I was talking about uh, a couple of weeks ago about TikTok. It's just, it doesn't make sense that this is still a debate that we have to have. It's, this is something, and, and you know, the media is just picking this up and as following on Twitch and everything, and as I'm involved, you know, a lot of with the Twitch streamers, uh, they're on YouTube, they're on Twitch, they're outraged. Uh, they don't understand, of course, you know, they're not coming from that uh, the traditional industry side at all. These yep. are the, the renegades, the rebels, the misfits, the outsiders <laughs> that are like, yo, we're doing this awesome stuff. Why now? Now it's like the greedy record labels. Well, I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> okay. So now all the people that have never had to deal with music are just like it's going through the same thing it was with youtubers back in the day but you know and gadget just um 
they I saw an art, uh, article that they posted out yesterday. I just came across this. Uh, so I wrote down here is, you know, they were saying that industry organizations also have pointed out that Twitch has not secured the proper mechanical and sync rights for soundtrack. So Twitch is now promoting soundtrack, saying, claiming they do have the licenses, but they only have licenses. They're saying they, they've... Um, they have licenses from some labels, CD Baby, SoundCloud, and have partnered with, quote, dozens of labels, distributors, and promoters. I mean, you know, what, what, is, what is a promoter? Like, this is, Twitch doesn't, I don't think Twitch understands anything what's going on in the music business, and they need to get that shaped up really quick. I mean, they, they, they went on a whole hiring spree to develop a music department, and it seems like they just don't listen to people who know things about music. It's confusing to me. Like, Amazon, which owns Twitch, has music licenses for its streaming platform, which Amazon Music Unlimited is now such a large revenue driver. Uh, you know, it's third place. It's it's not the biggest, but it's it's large enough that major music partners are not keen to – uh, bite the hand that feeds in a lot of ways. And so they don't want to kind of like get really drag out with Twitch about stuff and then potentially hurt their chances with Amazon and other regards. But at the same time, uh, you know, I think it's it's the way Twitch gets out of this is by controlling the backlash and directing it at the music partners and say, like, we're just complying. You know, we're just taking orders. We're just, you know, uh, doing what we have to do under the DMCA to protect you and protect our platform. But Twitch is the one who refuses to engage in equitable conversations about monetization and royalties. And, and frankly, Twitch could set the precedent here. They could be the ones to decide what the model is because live stream monetization in other parts of the web are also super hairy. Uh, on YouTube, for example, when you have a live stream on YouTube that includes copyrighted content, even stuff that you own, um, if it's detected by content ID, uh, a live stream that contains multiple content ID detections can get shut down in the middle of the stream. It's either a track or block. There's no monetize. The monetize doesn't flip on until after the stream is archived. I found this out the hard way with some of the creators that I work with at Studio 71 mm -hmm. and Twitch – Frankly, YouTube is not in a position where they want to pay more to creators for more stuff. They want creators to 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 you know create on the platform, use their live stream tools, do super chat, all the kind of stuff like that. Uh, but they don't want to have to deal with the record labels more than they have to. Twitch's fundamental business mm -hmm. is you know in in play here, and they have they have the ability to any opportunity to set the rules for everybody else and they just won't they just won't take the opportunity right and, and there, there's lots to unpack uh and we, i mean we could go on for a long time with this conversation so you have like first of all you have the lawyers coming in from you know you have you have a billionaire company you know so they have enough lawyers to handle this sure. but you know but here's an interesting thing so I'm, uh, there's two sides of this so from the twitch user side and they're complaining mm -hmm. like they rely on twitch and music for their revenue for their livelihood well there you go see now you're saying you're using somebody's music and you're generating so that's that's the case is like you're using somebody's music to help you get money Therefore, you should pay down. And that means how is it filtering and Twitch should be paying out for that. Uh, live streaming, Twitch said it's not going to be affecting live streaming. Here's my question. So they're building out like the, the, the music uh, department and everything. But Twitch is like Bezos like didn't even like remember that he owned Twitch, it seemed like. So it's right. a loss leader. This is a this is a brilliant man that doesn't believe in losing any profits. Is this something that's going to maybe become such a headache that it's like they're like, well, we acquired this in 2012 or 14 was when Amazon acquired Twitch. Maybe it's just something that they're going to spin off. I mean, this could be the, you know, the not the end, but it could be the fork in the road for Twitch. I'm not so sure about that. So mm. Amazon was unprofitable for a long time, even though it was driving billions of revenue. And it wasn't until recently that they just started throwing off massive profits after they stopped uh, the growth pursuit. I mean, this is the same kind of thing with, with 
Spotify, frankly, is that Spotify has repeatedly said like they could be profitable tomorrow if they just had to, you know, if they if they stopped fighting the market share game, but then they'd lose the market to Apple and Amazon. Amazon has so conquered the market that they don't have to worry about conquering more market share. They don't have to invest in that. Um, they've already grown, you know, Amazon Web Services to be this multi-billion dollar juggernaut, similar to Apple and their service department. It's like it's already a multi-billion dollar sector for them. So like they don't have to fight as tooth and nail as they used to to grow it. Um, so Twitch can afford to take losses. And frankly, it would track with the Amazon history in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that's you know difficult about everything around it is it seems almost like this is a pull toward what they've already done in terms of licensing. They like like the allowance of these DMCA takedowns to impact creators and then say like, well, hey, you could just use our new catalog of music that we licensed. It's like, yeah, but like that's not complete. That's not mm -hmm. a comprehensive solution. That's a stopgap. Uh, you know, it's like it's like if you went on YouTube and you made me you made content on YouTube and you said, oh, well, you're only allowed to use music from the YouTube audio library, which is all generic stock music or stuff that YouTube has licensed from independent creators on a flat fee basis, what have you, royalty free music. That doesn't help the ecosystem. That helps the comp the platform, the company. Right. And maybe the creator, but it doesn't help everybody. And there's an opportunity mm -hmm. to play nice, and they're just not taking it, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a and and the thing was, you know, it's based on those questions because that's what people are saying. They're like, it's the end of Twitch. It's going to be. It's 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 really not because Amazon's already because you have Twitch Prime, which they've already aligned with Amazon Prime. You can do watch movies. There's so much that is back end in there, and they just want that media outlet. So you know, we don't see that it's going to be uh, the end of Twitch. We and we they do have to play a little bit nicer in the sandbox, and we'll see how this rolls out over the next few weeks, month into next year so all right thank you sam we're going to be heading off to um uh on october 16th through 18th neva the national independent venue association association held a three-day virtual save our stages festival on their youtube channel the festival featured more than 30 artists including reba Brittany howard and little big town offering live performances from 25 historic indie music venues across the nation the result was the raising of over 1.8 million to aid independent music venues that have been forced to close their door to the covid 19 pandemic it's also important to note that neva has been aggressively lobbying congress to pass legislation to help indie venues weather the pandemic and support the state save our stages act which was authorized by senator amy klobuchar and john cornyn in july on october 1st the house of representatives passed the revised heroes act stimulus package a 2.2 trillion package which includes provisions of the save our stages act so with this to talk about his perspective on this is the duke dave how are you it's a good word I'm um, I'm good, Peter. Everything is blessed, bro. Great to see you, man. So, th I mean, this is a great show of support. I mean, the fact that they r raised nearly two million dollars for the independent venues, uh, you know. So, you know, what do you, you know, what do you, what's your perspective on all this? My perspective is, I kind of saw this go down because um, my buddy Steve Sternshine is the one who made this all happen, and you know, he was like the original uh, Shinobi Ninja manager. And he grew up with the drummer and the guitar player from Shinobi Ninja. So I've known Steve like before he was even a lawyer. So um, I was just happy to see this go down. And um, I, I love independent venues. Um, Live Nation is cool. I've played a lot of Live Nation venues and those are rad too. But um, the independent venues are kind of just like, uh, it's, it's more of like, um, kind of like the independent artist uh, or the independent thinker, if you will. You know, it's something that you have to protect. Um, it's easy for Live Nation, especially now, to go around and go like, hey, you guys can't pay your rent, eat them up and just throw a couple zeros at them and just, you know, just own the whole thing and just create that monopoly. And that kind of is really a sad, um, you know, perspective. I played a lot of independent venues and some of my greatest menu, uh, memories are like of, you know, playing uh, places for small crowds where like the promoter would like make us food from her house. And, you know, that's just the kind of thing that you find in independent venues. Um, it's just a special community and, and a vibration and not to take anything away from uh, Live Nation, um, which is just like a big corporate monopoly. But 
you know, if you play Live Nation venues, you know, the fridge is going to be stacked with whatever corporate uh, beverage that Live Nation has. But the independent venues really are like independent thinkers, like I said, you know, can really create what you want, make art. And I think it's important to, um, you know, curate um, uh, uh, independent thinking and and um, originality. Originality is so important. So uh, so shout out to Steve Sternshein for doing this. And $1.5 million is not a lot of money, especially if your rent is like 10000 a month. But it's a good um, it's a good starting point to say like, okay, but this thing needs to be saved and it's worth um, focusing on. So it doesn't just dissipate because it's so easy when, when the, 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 um, when things get down, it's so easy for the corporate entities to come and just eat it up. And, and, and live nation has the money. They got the zeros. They could eat up all these independent venues that are, that are struggling right now. So, um, I'm, I'm happy that, um, my man, Steve did this and I'm, and I'm happy that, uh, you know, things are going in this way. So I'm, I support the movement. Yeah, no, th this is fantastic. And, you know, and give uh, if next time you talk to Steve, tell him thanks for, you know, all the hard work he's done. This is really important. And, you know, it's it's interesting because when we you compare this to like and you were talking about Live Nation can easily acquire all these venues. And, you know, is it it's a lifeline, but it's also then it's becomes part of the Live Nation family. And some don't want to be part of that corporate. That's why they want to be completely independent. And it brings me back to the festival wars in New York City a few years ago when AEG was starting to get in. And then, you know, so then Governor's Ball was being, you know, they were just being, you know, all the walls were crashing in. And these are New Yorkers that started this festival from two people to like creating this massive festival that was really representative of New York City. And then they just weren't gonna be able to hack it because they could easily get squashed. And then they're like, we're never gonna to sell to Live Nation. And then two weeks later, they're like, so Live Nation bailed this out. You know, it's a lifeline. And they do get to still operate, uh, you know, under a certain level of autonomy. But, you know, it's like, you know, is what is what is the saving point? It's like, and how can other people support these venues? You know, what what is the way that we can keep? You know, like you said, one point five or one point eight, whatever uh, the numbers were, is not. It's a lot to personal a uh, person, but not a lot so much when you're looking at, uh, you know, overall the big picture. So how do we keep keep pushing forward to help this cause? I think the last thing I'm going to leave you guys with is. Um, it's not how you play the game, it's how the game plays you. And and that's the thing about it. It's like, there's so much emphasis on money, um, but really the emphasis should be on happiness. And if you could just take the value of money down and the value of happiness higher, then I think people will be more creative. And the more creative that you are, the more brand love you will have. I'm, I, I drink ginseng up. I've been drinking it since the 80s, man. I remember Snapple soda. I'll drink Snapple forever because I grew up with Snapple and it means something to me. But as soon as Snapple changes, I, I can't be into it anymore. So I think like brand love is important. So again, it's not how you play the game, but it's how the game plays you. And you got to protect your originality. That's the most important for independent venue and independent artists and independent thinkers. Right on. And, and for and for the, you know, for the listener and for the fans, you know, support the, you know, tune in, check out what the live stream is going on. Follow, you know, not, not just the artists, but follow those venues. If you might have not been following them on social media or signed up for their email list, because maybe you just more about, you know, the venue and you would just go there or you were following a band. But see what's going on with those venues, because they're doing stuff and there's a possible there's a way you could possibly help out. And again, so thank you, Dave. Uh, as always, a great perspective. So. And that's going to be it for today. Thank you all for tuning in. If you want to continue the conversation, leave a comment below. If you find this interesting, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell or whatever the button is on whatever platform you're at. You can also find us at musicindustrycity.com and on your preferred podcast player. Thank you again to my co-host, Sam and the Duke. Have a rocking day. Peace.